live. Those of you who are here live, I hope nobody's here dead. When well, you never know, maybe it's a good place to come if you if you are dead. Um, but also uh, welcome to all of you who are watching this on YouTube. So this is now, it's the first of a series on taking the Bodhisattva vow. And um, well, it, for me, it's a joy because we've had a, a lot of teachings. We're coming almost to a year of, of these Zoom teachings. And you'll know, I whinge, you'll moan at the beginning very often saying this is a huge topic and it's only a tiny sort of brief overview. And that's a bit frustrating for me because all of the beauty is in the details. So now it's not like that. Now we've got uh, five weeks. We've got time to explore something. And also, although it's teaching, so it's me going blah, 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 blah. Even though it's teachings and information, this is about practice. Uh, it's not just up there with the ideas. This is about you. I think many of you want to take the Bodhisattva vow or have taken it and would like to uh, deepen your uh, appreciation. And so let's start, especially today, as we're talking about the Bodhisattva vow, let's start with the excellent motivation of the uh, Bodhisattva. And so this means that with a very inclusive mind and a very loving mind, then we, um, just a moment, then we, uh, a very happy mind too. We are thinking we'll listen to these teachings, absorb these teachings for the benefit of everybody. So we'll come back to that in a minute. And uh, sometimes when uh, lamas start teaching, they give a whole series of uh, the three this and the six that and something else to do with our motivation because the first beginning is always about the best motivation. It needs to be good, it needs to be pure, and it needs to be strong. And so just today, I'll remind you of uh, the three examples of the pot to be avoided because see, when we take teachings, our motivation is I'm doing this for everybody. We've got a responsibility very much connected to the Bodhisattva vow. So because of that responsibility, then um, we need to make a good job of listening. So first, we try to be not like an upturned pot. So a pot, which is normally something that can receive uh, liquid, if it's upturned, then nothing goes in. And so if our mind is not open and our awareness is not attuned to what's coming in, then nothing will go in. And so we try not to be like that. Uh, it's, it's, it's the guideline for meditation. Our mind can be so distracted that we don't do what we sat down and intended to do. So we try not to be like an upturned pot. The second one is funny in English. We don't want to be like a cracked pot or a crack pot. <laughs> That's not a nice word in English, crack pot. So that means that although something is coming in, it's leaking out. It's like they say in English, goes in one ear and out the other. So it's kind of, yeah, and we listen. But uh, two hours from now, how much will be retained? And by next week, how much will have stayed inside? So we try to listen in a way which is not just hearing and going, <laughs> but hearing and thinking, oh, must keep this, keep it in a safe place. So not like a cracked pot. And thirdly, not like a poisoned pot where, so we make an effort not to have desire, anger, 
or whatever it may be, uh, mixing in our mind with the pure teachings of the uh, Buddha. I went to, I gave a talk once, it was in Manchester University, Buddhist society. And one lady came up at the end and she said, I'm glad I stayed because, uh, you know, when I came in and saw you wearing a sports jacket and a bow tie, I thought, who on earth is this? And I wasn't going to stay, uh, but uh, I'm glad I did. So you never know, it probably meant that she was there <laughs> for an hour's talk and uh, feeling very angry at me because if you wear a sports jacket then you wear a different sort of tie or no tie at all so you may be sitting there getting quite upset at the way i'm delivering this talk but please don't so anyway now let's do some prayers and in particular we think of those who are our own karma our parents our children our siblings our friends our enemies in particular those who've harmed us who are our enemies. Thank you. Sonje Chodon Soji Chonomla Jancho Badun Dane Chosanje. Dagi Jinso Chipe Sanomje Trolla Penchera Sonje Drop Bara Sho. Samchan Tamche Dewa Dong Dewe Jodong Dem Para Joche. Dongal dong dongal ji jo dong chal wara jo ji. Dongal me pe de wa dong pa dong men chal wara jo ji. Nyerin cha dong ne ton chal we ton yom chen po la ne para jo ji. De ya ta shan ne shama wati shama ta sha trom. Om Kurim Om Kurim Aratite Karota Ke Orite Jovati O Loyane Beshudan Male Malapa Naye Kukore Kaka Krasi Krasana O Muki Para Muki A Muki Shamatane Sawa Graha Bandanane Nikriheta Sawa Para Prava Dinabe Mukta Mara Pasha Satapita Bolda mudra nungatita sava mare bucarita parishuti Pega santu sava mara tamane Palen sawe lama rinpoche Dagye chewara pende tenshola Karin Champo Gone Jesonte Kuson Tuji Nadrup Saldo Sol. Thank you. So in this uh, course, we'll, as usual, try to look at the inside, the mind side, the you side, the real meaning side of uh, taking the Bodhisattva vow, uh, as opposed to the outer side where you've got a world of Buddhism and lamas and monasteries and traditions, and you know people do things, they take refuge, they learn prayers, uh, they take the Bodhisattva vow. Um, so, but let's start out there and the reason for this course. And in my work, then people approach me over the last couple of years uh, since COVID and with so many Dharma centers closed and they say, well, you know, I want to take refuge, but now there's no opportunity or I want to do this practice, and but I need the empowerment and uh, what to do. Or in this case, um, I want to take the Bodhisattva vow. And uh, so there's no opportunity. 
So I talked with um, Sita Rinpoche's secretary, and because um, I checked out online if people could take the Bodhisattva vow online and then to find out who was doing it. And at the time, only two people were doing it. Uh, none of them were from our Kaju tradition. So I contacted and talked with um, Taisitupa's secretary, Tenan, and I said, well, first of all, do you think, given the circumstances of COVID, it's okay for people to take this very deep vow commitment online? And um, then secondly, at the moment, there's only these two lamas doing it. And uh, they seem to me very good lamas, but do you think it's okay to suggest to people that they, if they really want, they do this online? So anyway, that led to some discussion. I think he probably checked back with Taisi Tupa. And he said, you yeah, know, it's fine. Uh, you can tell people if they want to do that, that's, that's fine to go ahead. They're good lamas. And given the circumstances, it will work. So then, because you can take the Bodhisattva vow, not necessarily from a Lama, but you can take it in front of a shrine, I thought maybe then I could present a course leading up to being with people so that they can, you know, together we can take the Bodhisattva vow uh, in front of a shrine, our own shrine, or visualize presences of the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, and all of the gurus. So that was my idea. Um, my own <coughs> training from Akon Rinpoche was, he said, I only want my people to take Bodhisattva vow from a really wonderful Bodhisattva Lama, not just any Lama. And so in the history of Samiling, uh, so over decades, the Bodhisattva vow was only given a handful of times, because Hakon Rinpoche wanted, if there was someone who gave it, for that person to be really an ideal, respectable bodhisattva. And it says in Gampova's teachings, the person who gives the vow should not just know how to give the vow and hold the lineage for it, but they themselves should embody what a bodhisattva is and thereby inspire. So it's not just a, a transmission with a lineage, like an ordination, but it's also they are living. They are the living lineage of being a bodhisattva, and something of that brushes off, comes into us when we receive the vow. So if we receive it from somebody, then that somebody, ideally, is somebody very, very special. And... Um, and very, very special people that when the 16th come up, uh, first came to Europe, then uh, people were encouraged, just do it. You know, Maybe you don't quite know exactly what you're doing, but an opportunity like this to receive the Bodhisattva vow directly from the Karmapa never happened for lay people in Tibet. Would only happen for the highest uh, masters. So they just said, just do it. You, know, you, you won't get this opportunity again. So anyway, that's how this course evolved. And I need to make it very clear from the start. I am not giving you the Bodhisattva vow. I am not capable of giving you the Bodhisattva vow. But this is all about how we can take the Bodhisattva vow on our own directly from the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha in our mind. And when we come to the end, the last session, then I'll be leading you through um, that particular uh, process. So there we go. Uh, that's how the course evolved. So then uh, what, what is it about? Just let me check. Yeah, that's good. Uh, well, really, it's about you and you. You and what you're doing with yourself, what you're doing with your life, where you're going. 
And in another way, it's about you and ultimate truth. What we can't do here, uh, but what maybe you'd like to do, if you've got the time, is go back through all of the teachings uh, I've given on Zoom this year about bodhicitta. Because this course is about actually you or somebody taking the commitment. Before we were talking about bodhicitta, what people do, what Buddhists do, what bodhisattvas have done in the past, and the whole journey and what it involves. So there are 12 YouTube teachings. I put them together as a playlist that we've had this year. And ideally, you'd go back to those. I think many of you took part in them. And um, so revise what bodhicitta is in general. And in those talks, I said again and again how it's about you and you, you and your mind, and developing all the good qualities of mind. And also it's about you as a consciousness. And we'll come back to that today as a stream of consciousness. And you, the truth of you, being your Buddha nature, which has always run parallel with this stream of consciousness. So since beginning this time, it says, inside, changelessly, our mind has been Buddha, pure. But also since beginning this time, we've been making karma, and the power of karma has made our unique story. For the moment, <clears throat> that unique story of karma, this stream of consciousness as opposed to pure awareness, consciousness uh, rules our life. It's made us be born in this body through karma. It's given us our parents, our children, our siblings. It's given us our poverty, our wealth. It's given us our health and our sickness. It's given us our friends and our enemies. And short of very exceptional circumstances, it has already determined our lifespan. So much is already pre-programmed in consciousness by karma. We're caught up in it almost completely until we start to meditate, until we're told about our inner purity of mind, Buddha nature. And so in the bodhicitta teachings, then we've seen how we can work on ourselves relatively and how we can work on this ultimate truth of what we are and how we can do these uh, together. And we saw in those teachings that bodhicitta has two aspects. One is the aspiration, where we are training our mind, reformulating our mind, purifying our mind, our mentality. Aspiration bodhicitta, we are aspiring. And there's one phrase that sums it all up. We're aspiring to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Aspiration bodhicitta. But that's not all we are. We're not just a thinking, feeling, aspiring mind. We also, through our karma, are in a world of people and of situations in which we have not just mind, but body and speech. We interact with others, we communicate. Speech means not just what you say, it's the whole interaction, the intercourse we have with others, the flow, the exchange. And then the fact of being in a body has an impact on the world, as we know, through our impact. It's this weekend, the big COP conference. Just being alive means you need to eat, you need shelter, you have an impact on other people on animal life, on the planet's life. And then having a body, then we have drives, we have biological drives, hormonal drives. 
things make us angry, things make us desire, and so on. So there's practice bodhicitta where we need to make that living relative reality as harmless and as beneficial as it can be. And there's a huge amount of work to be done there. So this course is about taking the aspiration bodhisattva commitment. Just like you can become a novice monk or nun, and then once you've got used to it and you've trained as a novice, so you know really what a real fully fledged monk or nun is, then you can take the full commitment. So aspiration bodhicitta, where you're committed, keyword, you are committed to training your mind, to making your mind the bodhisattva mind. At the same time, you're testing the waters of body and speech, your impact on other people, the environment, interrelationship, interconnection. Because you're training to take later on the practice bodhicitta commitment, whereby you are sworn, if that's the word you know, I can't find a strong enough word, committed, sworn, dedicated to live as a bodhisattva, to protect life, no matter what, no matter what, even if it costs you your own life and all the other things that a bodhisattva does. So to say this course is about taking the aspiration training, training of one's own heart, heart and mind. And let's say heart. I read something very nice yesterday. I think it was true. You can't trust what you read these days. But it's about um, the heart, which in earlier years of science, when science was in the sort of steam engine phase, the heart was seen as the pump that just sort of pumps your blood around the body. And the brain was kind of the big deal. And since then, they found that the heart has got so many, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a gland, it's part of an endocrine system. It's got an amazing effect on the body. It's not just a pump at all. So anyway, our heart, now mind, training those. That's what we're going to look at. And in particular, this step of taking the bodhisattva commitment. Give me a second. So what we need to know then is first about commitments. And uh, although we've had something about this in the previous courses this year, uh, I can't assume that all of you attended all of the courses. So I have to tell you the difference, the meaning, the reason why vows, precepts, refuge, and bodhisattva vow are so important in Dharma. They are different from attitude. They are different from inclination. And that difference we need to understand because it's huge. Some people might say, you know, I don't want to go into a shrine room and go through a ceremony and sort of all of this, you know, bowing down and making promises and about being a bodhisattva. I believe in love. I believe in service to other people. I subscribe to those values. I believe if we're alive, we should be. We should be a good human being. So that's attitude. It's inclination. It's very good. Nothing wrong with that at all. But it comes and it goes. 
it's triggered by circumstances. It's not as though all of the time we are thinking about love and service. So if anyone asks, if somebody stops you for a, a survey in an airport, they come around. I say, excuse me, sir, would you mind <coughs> giving me five minutes for a very, very meaningful survey? And then um, do you believe in humans should be of service to each other? Oh, of course. And, but you're not thinking about it all the time. You are not committed to it. You've not signed a contract with life whereby that is your main point of being alive. So in terms of karma, each moment we are thinking purely about serving and about love and about compassion, then um, we make the good mental karma, virtuous karma of virtuous thoughts. But that making of karma only lasts for the seconds that your mind is in that place, and then it's gone. Whereas when we take a vow, and when we take a vow properly, which is, we'll see later, with vows you need to, there's this, this four stages. First, you need to take them properly so that you've, received it you've set it in motion when we take a vow then the karma the virtuous karma expressed in that vow in this case to become a buddha to help all sentient beings is being generated every moment of day and night it says, even if you're deeply unconscious, even if you fainted from the time you take the vow and receive the vow until the time you break it or until the time the vow is finished, if you've taken it for 24 hours or a year or whatever, then in that time, the effect is constant. So in terms of generating karma if you think now truthfully how many times a day how many seconds of my day i don't know how many seconds there are in a day you can calculate but how many of those seconds were thoughts of service and compassion how many of those seconds were me thinking ken i really want to get enlightened and thinking, how can I help my fellow beings the most? You know, there wouldn't be, I think, for most of us, that many seconds. We spend many more seconds every day thinking about laundry and food and all the other things. So just think of the difference in terms of karma between those that fraction of the day which is the seconds of inclination, of attitude, of pure thought, virtuous thought, and simply all day long and all night long. This is why we take vows. We are helping ourselves. So this is why we're going to take the bodhisattva vow. You may think bodhisattva is great. And you know, one day, yeah, sure. Uh, that's what I want to be. That's the best thing to be. And I think when we receive the Bodhisattva teachings, we all feel like that. But when it comes to, okay, so if that's how you feel, I just happen to have a piece of paper here. So I'm thinking of the opposite now. Let, let's have a few moments of humor and let Ken talk about a film you probably never saw, which is a, quite an old film now called Crossroads. It's a... It's about a guy, a guy who sells his soul to the devil at a crossroads in order to be successful as a musician. It's a very, I like it, a very, very good film. And uh, so anyway, 
no more publicity for the film. But, you know, the, the guy's poor, he's not successful, and so on. And then the devil turns up in an old 1920s Model T Ford at the crossroads and comes out with this contract and says, you know, well, if you'll sell me your soul, I'll fix up all the rest for this life. So now the guy's coming to the end of his life, he's old, and he's wondering how he can <laughs> get out the contract. And so it's a, it's a road journey with somebody who saves his bacon. There's a signing up. It's really very serious. So if you think Bodhisattva's great, and yeah, that's, that's kind of the better part of me, but then uh, a real bodhisattva comes along, or bodhisattva agent Ken comes along and says, well, I just happen to have the contract here. If you'd like to read through it and just sign on the bottom, then uh, would you be ready? Would you be ready? Commitment. So let's have a look at what's going on. And if you remember, one of our early courses was about consciousness and wisdom. What, what are we? What are we? We are, as far as most, in most respects, we are um, a stream, what's called a stream of consciousness. Oh, I'm just looking at my bird clock. It doesn't seem to have. Did anybody hear it make a noise? No. No hoopoo. Oh, dear, the batteries are flat. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're a stream of consciousness. Consciousness. Thoughts. Feelings ideas, memories, plans. We live in reality to a certain extent, coming in through our five senses, five sense consciousnesses. We live a lot of the time in our imagination, remembering, fantasizing, thinking about things in abstract thought. We are unique. It's easier to see. It's funny because you can't see consciousness. But when we look around us at our neighbors, people in our family, everyone is so obviously who they are. And they're wrapped up in their own stuff. Someone looking after an elderly parent all day long. Their life just now are very much thinking about that, wrapped up in that, wrapped up in their own state, difficulties, because it's, you know, they can't do this, they can't do that, and so on. That's their world. Somebody being successful in politics is very much into that. They're, I've had a few friends in politics when it comes to election time. They're out all the time visiting local shopkeepers and other people, shaking hands, and producing leaflets. Their, their minds into elections, local issues. If you have children, then children are very, very occupying. And whatever it is, if you're a musician, then you are practicing and listening to other musicians. Your world is full of music and those kind of things. And then some people, they're naturally quite gay and happy. Some people are very worried and nervous. Some people are angry a lot. This soup, this ongoing soup of a personality, so unique to each one. And we see how caught up people are in these. And of course, when we interact, we're taking all of that on board. We factor it in, what you can say to them, what you can't say to them, and how you can help, not help, all of that. But then... The main thing is through observing around us, we can start to consider our own case and see how our, our own mind is caught up in this, caught up in that just now. 
how we're hoping that next year and when we retire or tomorrow, this will happen, how we're afraid that that might happen, how we are so much carrying a huge baggage of our past. It just hits me more and more how people are just grown up kids, how so much of what happens in their formative years, they carry to the grave. And they're sorting it out psychologically till they get to the grave. It's enormous. So we see for ourselves how much we are completely drawn into that, dealing with it, making the best of it, and living this life as though pretty much that's it. That's our main focus. Now, in that stream of consciousness, each moment is a new moment, and we're dealing with it, reacting to it as it comes up. But behind the way we deal with it, we react to it, is a basic idea of me. A self-image, a set of values, a set of beliefs, a set of interpretations about the world, about other people, our parents, our children, projections. Now, that's longer lasting than each moment. Like I said, when we carry baggage from the past, from our childhood, this presence, this idea of your mother, your father, and so on, you carry it with you and how they treated you and who you are because of that, a failure, a success, the golden boy who's the best child in the whole world, or the failure that's looked down on, and so on. It's so vivid. So this story of me, this story of me, is behind so much. It's longer lasting than what you do in this hour, what you do today. It changes all the time. Buddha tells us it doesn't last, it's not fixed. But nevertheless, it is super powerful. And because of this story of you, story of me, then we make karma. Virtue and non-virtue. And this is like writing the story of your very own future. By how we react today, what we say, what we do, and with the thinking behind it, then in the next life, people will be acting upon us or in some future life. So when we take the Bodhisattva vow, how can it be that by taking the vow, all of a sudden we've made something that will generate virtuous karma all day long while you're awake and while you're asleep? Is there some magic? Or are the Lama is just telling you this because they want you to take the vow. So I need to tell you straight away now, we need to make this very clear. This whole course is for your benefit. I don't get commission on every new bodhisattva that signs up. I don't get brownie points. I don't get stars up in heaven. It's a, it's a serious thing to open up this opportunity to people. If you take the Bodhisattva vow indirectly, you will benefit many, many, many people. But mainly, it's you who will benefit. So it's not that the Lamas are encouraging you to take the vow because they get some cosmic commission on it. Is because they want you to look after yourself well. You to stop harming other people. You to bring benefit to other people. But they're not telling you falsities by saying from the moment you take the vow onwards, it changes everything. It's because of the nature of this consciousness. We call it sixth consciousness of the eight consciousnesses. Behind the consciousness that changes second by second is this background 
coloring, this background programming of the story of me. And based on that story of me, then we'll make this karma, that karma, and that karma. It's the background reason for the karma we make. So when you take the Bodhisattva vow, you are radically, and once and for all, from this moment onwards, changing the story of me. That's the whole point. So when it says from the moment of taking the vow until the time of breaking it, or when it comes to an end, your vision of you, because now you become a bodhisattva, your vision of you is the new background feeling. This point needs to go in deeply. I don't know how you think of you. Some people find it very hard even to think of themselves. It's kind of a difficult topic, especially if they've had powerful and difficult childhoods. It's easier to think of other things, stuff, other people, projects. But this point needs to settle in. But however your feeling of you is, when your mind turns inwards and you try and meet yourself, that is going to change. Through a properly received transmission in a ceremony, you are going to change your thinking of you to now I am the Bodhisattva. It's huge. It's huge. And it's wonderful. So what we'll see as this week and then next weekend we have a, it's a the monthly Tonglen session. So there's not a Bodhisattva Vow session next Saturday. It's the Saturday after. But today and in two weeks time, we're going to see how there is this reshaping of the idea of me through three things. One is taking refuge. And taking refuge is uh, a necessity before you can take the Bodhisattva vow. It's not just a technical necessity, it's a psychological necessity. So we'll explore that. The next session will be very much about refuge. Second, another necessity before we can take the Bodhisattva vow, we must take at least one precept for life. Preferably more. And in the earlier days of Buddhism, usually people took monastic ordination before the Bodhisattva vow because monastic ordination is a series of commitments for not harming others. And it will be a contradiction if you're promising to help all beings, become a servant of all beings to help them, and at the same time you're not committed to avoiding harm towards them. Some very, very interesting essay topics and in France, philosophy is part of the um, secondary school curriculum. And so children are taught to think in terms of traditional Western philosophy. And so you get essays. And there's one topic in Tibet about butchers. Uh, most people believed in not killing, but they ate meat. I'm not saying anything's good or bad. I'm just telling you the way it was, right? You've got your own opinions about that. But so then they had special, they had people who would come and when it was time to you know, slaughter, they'd do that. Some of those people would say, Om Mani Padme Hung, 
the compassion mantra for the animals they were killing. And other people just killed them. They were just butchers. So the debate is the sort of essay topic. Is it more virtuous to say, Om Mani Padme Hum, while you're killing an animal? Or is it a contradiction and a sort of, a, whatever you can call it, uh, can't find the word, a horrible thing. Please write a thousand words. It's not straightforward. Huh? You say, well, the animal is going to die anyway. Better to die with an Omani Padme Hum than nothing. And the other, you can say, well, this is an insult to the Omani Padme Hum, because how can you express compassion and at the same time act in a way which is completely in conflict? So the precepts, the Buddhist precepts, whether it be one of the five main precepts, the lay precepts, ordained precepts, are a precondition for the bodhisattva vow. At least part of our activity in life must be dedicated to not harming. So refuge, commitment. Precept, commitment. And then the commitment of the bodhisattva vow itself. So, um, it's one of the main topics this morning. I needed to talk about it, this commitment. So, this week and next week, we'll be looking at the commitment and why we take those vows, why we need the refuge vow, precepts, and then the bodhisattva vow, and how that is all a reshaping of who we are. Next week, when we look at refuge, then we are taking refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha, and the gurus. And we'll look at the psychology of taking refuge. What you believe in, the whole way you see life, the universe, whatever it may be. So anyway, uh, we've got um, let me see, commitment. Now, with a commitment, we need to, first of all, take it properly. I suppose first and first of all, we need to understand what it is. But then when we're ready for it, then we take the commitment through a ceremony. And what we're looking at in these coming weeks is what the ceremony involves. It's a bit like an initiation ceremony. In as much as when we receive empowerment in Vajrayana, you get a, a brief trip around what you're going to be doing in your Vajrayana practice. So uh, it's a bit like if you're going to become uh, a woodworking apprentice, then before you are uh, taken into the apprenticeship through some ceremony, you're taken around the workshop, you see the tools, you're allowed to handle the tools, you can touch the materials, you get a kind of a brief trip around the universe of a woodworker, and then you sign up for the apprenticeship. So in an empowerment ceremony, where you've got ritual objects and things happen, and we re repeat things after the teacher, we're getting an insight into what we're going to do. So in the Bodhisattva vow ceremony, we do things such as say, the seven branches of prayer, seven. These happen all the time in Tibetan Buddhist practice. You, know, you make offerings, you make prostrations, you do what people call, I don't like it, but they call it confession, whereby you are purifying your past karma and rejoicing in the virtue of others. So if you go to the ceremony, then the teacher just says, now we need to gather virtue through the seven branch prayer. So repeat after me. Chatsalwadon, Chatsalwadon, <laughs> and so on, Chatsal, and Choshin Shokwadon, Jesu Yir, and so on. And that's it. Oh, 
I just made a great deal of virtue through the seven branch prayer. Uh, right. So then this is like a brief in one verse you've expressed something very profound. I prostrate. What's prostration about? Respect for what is worthy of respect in life. What do we normally respect in our stream of consciousness? And now we're learning through the Dharma. What is the most wonderful, the most beautiful, the most meaningful thing, which is pure mind. Those who have pure minds. What are Buddhas? What are Bodhisattvas? How much have they done to become like that? How wonderful that the presence in this world like the great teachers we meet, is so amazing for so many people. So that respect we don't have at first. We need to cultivate respect. And in order to cultivate respect, we also need to get rid of pride. So doing prostrations is the remedy for pride and an opening up of an awareness to the wonders of this universe that we are going to acquire. So we'll explore that as one topic. And then the purification of past karma. Can it be purified? How can it be that harmful things that we've done in past lives can be purified now by what we do with our mind and our speech? How is that possible? And then how actually do we do it? And what is the need for it? Because it stands in the way like a wall of our spiritual progress. You can't go any further if you've got killing karma to get rid of, injuring, harming karma, bad speech karma, and so on. That has to go. It's, it's like a straitjacket. So everything that's behind chushin shaka, four words when we do the prayer, it's enormous, and so on. So there are seven branches uh, that we do in the ceremony. But when we do the ceremony together, we'll spend a precious moment with each. Because beforehand, I try and explain what they really mean and how afterwards, as a bodhisattva, you'll be cultivating all of those seven aspects to help your mind grow and mature to shed its foolishness, its immaturity, its ignorance, its darkness. So we need to understand the transmission that comes when we take the commitment. Then we need to take it properly. So the ceremony needs to be done well. There needs to be the presence of lineage, either through the master who gives it or through what we understand as we stand before our own shrine. It needs to be taken properly. Once we've taken it, then it needs to be maintained because it's a very deep reprogramming of yourself. It's a powerful commitment. If you think of it as a contract, and this isn't so much the aspiration vow, but the practice vow. It says, you signed up to help all sentient beings because you have a precious human existence. You've got everything going for you. Look, there are billions on this planet who don't. You may not think it. You know, you're a bit like, uh, what, Harry Potter or, or um, Frodo. You're the chosen one, whether you like it or not. You've got everything going for you. Like them, it's me, but I'm just, uh, I'm just an old me. But when you do, you tick off the boxes. Are you this? Are you that? Do you have this opportunity? Do you have the time? Do you have the teaching? And so on. You find you're very, very rare on this planet of 7 billion people. There aren't that many other humans who have this opportunity. So there you are. And now you've taken the commitment to give the rest of this life and all your future lives 
to a more and more service to other beings. So if you drop it, if you don't progress, you're effectively, because you signed the contract, you are breaking your contract, you are ripping off every other living being in the universe. You promised to help them. All of those people without your opportunity, they're looking to you. Come on, come on, Ken. You know, make it. Next life a bit better than the life afterwards. And we're connected. And you're going to get us out of this mess. And then there's lazy Ken who say, yeah, well, yeah, no, this, this life I'm having a life off. I deserved it. I, I, I did a lot last life already. So, um, and then maybe next slide. I mean, I mean, I do think it's a good thing. In general, I'm on the case, you know, but uh, so you broke your contract. And when we look at what's really behind the Bodhisattva vow, because you love and care for other beings so much, so much, then it's just horrible. Horrible. So once we've taken it properly and received this induction into the family of bodhisattvas, then we need to keep ourselves there, at least. And then ideally, not just maintain, but enable it to grow. So that the bodhisattva part of us is getting stronger and stronger. And all that stream of consciousness from lifetimes of conditioning that takes us into trouble is getting weaker and weaker and weaker. We have to make sure we know what breaks the commitment. This beautiful state of mind, the basic feeling of who I am, this new definition of me, what will make us lose it? Because we can lose it, what could you say? on the quiet. This happens. I've seen it happen. It's not as though somebody makes a decision to not be a bodhisattva anymore or to have some time off. The six consciousness, the stream of consciousness and habits is so tricky. An amazing con artist. It knows all the tricks. It's survived up to now. So bit by bit, your beautiful, inspired bodhisattva mind won't even see it. Your beautiful meditation experience of oneness and connection, you won't even see it gradually, disappears a bit, disappears a bit. And then after weeks or months, you're just not quite the person you were. So we need to see what damages it. We need to see what uh, breaks it, the Bodhisattva commitment. Make sure we don't do those things. But, but with the aspiration bodhicitta, we are working on our mind. We didn't take the commitment formally yet for our body and speech actions. So the mind, as you probably know, is not that reliable. And so we will blow it. So when we do see that we've broken it, then we need to know how to repair it. We need to know how quickly we need to repair it. We need to know how to repair it to get ourselves back into this identification, this story of me, for sure, I'm a bodhisattva now and from now onwards so as i said earlier on this is about you and you it's about you and the very nature of all existence all being so to understand taking the vow we need to zoom out you need to see you in this life on planet earth born with those parents, growing up in that story, and now woo, totally pickled in that story. You need to see you from a cosmic perspective of many lives. You were one of those before. Wherever it was, 
you were born to those parents, whoever they were, you had those children, if you had children and so on, you're in that place, you did this job, you got completely involved with it. And it's all gone. And what we're involved with now will all go. So in all of that, life to life to life to life, there's been this opportunity to not identify with that story, which will be there. Circumstantial story will be there, even when you're a bodhisattva. We'll keep coming back all the way until your Buddha, the people, the poverty, the wealth, the health, the sickness, those stories will play themselves out. But who you are in relation to the karma of your stream of consciousness, you have the opportunity to change. You have the opportunity to change. So we need to zoom out and see, wow, look right now at the age that you're at, you have the opportunity to redefine yourself. Now, when this happens, and, uh, uh, well, let me sum it up. There's a text that I, from Shanti Deva's uh, Bodhisattva Way of Life. The very first chapter tells us about how wonderful this opportunity. It says it doesn't matter how deeply you've been immersed in suffering, in making suffering, in samsara. Taking this vow and maintaining it and being true to it can purify all of that. And it doesn't mean that if you've been in samsara for 100,000 lifetimes, now you need to be a bodhisattva for 100 thousand lifetimes it can be very quick the purification so please don't think uh, ken not, not you think me think to ken ken you're a nasty bit of work how dare you even think of being a bodhisattva these are the pure guns these are the good guys in the universe you are a filthy mess. Look at your mind. Look where it goes. You know, you'll never make it. Don't even think of this. This is for people who are ready. It's not like that. It's not like that. You deserve this as soon as possible because it is the redefining of yourself that makes all the difference. There's just not the time, but this whole question of how you tell yourself who you are is behind all of our story. And the moment you can stop and say, I'm like everyone else inside my mind has total compassion, total wisdom, total goodness, total peace. We're all like that deep inside. And now I'm going to know this is the true me and act as though it's the true me. So the first verse of Shantideva tells us how wonderful it is to take the vow and how it's like a, a wonderful tree that will give. Once you start, you planted the tree of bodhicitta, then it will just grow and grow and give better and better fruits for everybody. So I need to tell you about that. I need to tell you about... Um, what is called the twofold benefit. You now we say, I'm going to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. I'm going to achieve enlightenment means I'm going to do the best possible thing for myself. Now the word enlightenment in English and we'll look at this more next, next time, next session. Sounds a bit like a light bulb moment, doesn't it? Ah, somebody is enlightened. Or achieving enlightenment is as though suddenly the penny drops. Some big realization happens. Or we say becoming Buddha. 
And however you think of Buddha, when I say the word Buddha, what comes up in your mind, in your imagination? And think, I'm going to become one of those. What we mean is, I'm going to become the best possible thing, being that anyone could ever become. I'm going to do myself the greatest favor. So rather than thinking, become a Buddha, when we don't really know what Buddha means, or become enlightened, where it sounds like something's going to happen one day and the light switched on, we look at the reality of it. Your mind now is confused, like mine. You know that when you sit down and meditate. Look where it goes. Look what it does. Look what it thinks. Look how it's uncontrollable. That's the truth of you. It's the truth of me. So you're going to sort that out. Your mind is going to be what you want it to be. It's going to be mastered, fully mastered, so that even the tiniest poisonous things, feelings, thoughts, are gone. You will feel so strong, like the rocky roots of a mountain, because your meditation mind will be so stable. We're full of likes and dislikes, and we can be loving and caring to a certain degree. For some people, we can be quite difficult for other people. We're going to sort that out. You're going to be nothing but kindness, whatever love is and however wonderful love is, we're going to be the best and the purest love that's ever possible. Whatever compassion is, we're going to become that. Can you think of any greater gift to yourself? And then do you want to be wise or stupid? <laughs> Sometimes it's quite tempting to want to be stupid because then you're not aware of what's going on. You sometimes think it's a blessing for somebody to be stupid because wisdom is difficult. But nevertheless, we don't want to be stupid because we get ourselves and other people into trouble. We cause suffering. So you want to be wise, not knowledgeable, wise, deeply wise, deeply knowing about what's going on. So you can help everybody. So you're making yourself as wise as possible and whatever gifts and skills one can acquire to help others because sometimes just now we feel so helpless you want to help other people but what, what have you got what are your tools how well are you equipped we're going to equip ourselves so that we have something to offer to others so this is what becoming enlightenment means you could never do anything better for yourself Never. So it's called ultimate benefit for oneself. That's what we are committing ourselves to, making a solemn promise for. And then the second benefit is benefit for others. It could be that what was most beneficial for others isn't the most beneficial for oneself. In this world, very often we have an idea that you have to kind of sacrifice your own well-being for the welfare of others. And in, in everyday life, it's very much like that. You know, if you're a mother of children, there's lots of things you can't do that you'd like to do because your priority is to serve and help, help your children, of course. So there is very often in worldly thinking, worldly reality, it's not necessary that what's the best thing for you is the best things for others. But when we see what enlightenment really is, this peace, this stability, this strength, these skills, then we see not only is that the best for oneself, but it makes us the best person to help others. The two go perfectly together. So when we take the Bodhisattva vow, 
then um, we are committing ourselves to that twofold benefit. I want, I promise to become enlightened, to be of help to all sentient beings. So today's sort of overview is almost coming to an end. Uh, what to, I would have liked to have read you all of the first chapter of Shanti Deva's uh, Bodhisattva's life. If you get the chance to read it, please do. Uh, you can find it online um, if you don't have the book. I need to tell you basically what you are committing yourself to that will develop in the coming weeks. First, we've got five things. One, we are learning how not to abandon our bodhisattva mind. And we'll see that means we learn not to exclude anybody. Our bodhisattva mind needs to include everyone. Not everyone except the man next door who mows the lawn at two o'clock in the morning and keeps us all awake. <laughs> It means everyone, the very worst, the very worst, not just humans, the very worst entities, the very worst harm to us of all sorts are included in our love and compassion. So we must learn <clears throat> that if we do exclude anyone, then uh, that will break our bodhisattva vow unless we fix it within a certain time period. We need to adjust our mind to re-include them. <clears throat> That's number one, not abandoning our bodhisattva mind. Number two, we mustn't let it degrade. And I mentioned a few minutes ago how that can happen without you even noticing. We need to be watchful. And so the way that helps us be watchful is we make a point of reminding ourselves of bodhisattva qualities. We read about bodhisattvas. We read about the sutras. We read the sutras. We read the great life stories of our lineage. Um, we remind ourselves of the bodhisattva qualities and so that we don't just drift away from our first uh, inspiration. That's number two. Not abandoning, not letting it degrade. Number three, we need to strengthen our inspiration, our motivation. And the way we do that is by putting fuel in your tank. It's called the two accumulations. So we need to develop goodness day after day through kind thoughts, kind actions, kind speech. That builds up an inner wealth. It's like charging up a battery that will strengthen your bodhicitta because it it's harmonious, it's compatible with the whole point of bodhicitta. So we develop our goodness, the accumulation of goodness, at the same time, our wisdom of interdependence, why people are born, what karma is all about, why it's all happening. We get wiser about that so we can deal with it. So that as a bodhisattva, we can deal with the huge suffering that's out there. We need to strengthen it. And then we need to increase it in volume. The strengthening is like putting more vitamins, more inner strength into it. And then this number four is expanding, which means we bring it online more and more of the time. So at least six times a day, we stop in our tracks and we do the Bodhisattva commitment prayer. And more than that, we do whenever we can have a little moment so that this lifelong habit of being plunged into the details of life, we stop uh, again, again, or like an alarm clock. Again, you're a bodhisattva. Don't forget it. You're on the way somewhere magnificent. This life's just a dream. It's very, very temporary. These things are temporarily important, but don't forget the big thing, the twofold benefit. So then we remind ourselves, we relax. It's so beautiful. Even if it's just for 20 seconds, then you can get back to cooking your macaroni 
or whatever it is, you know. We increase it more and more times in the day. Do om mani padme hum, as much as you can, and so on. And then last, we learn not to forget it by avoiding what are called four dark actions. We'll come back to those next week. And cultivating their opposites, four bright actions. So I'd like to share with you, just to finish off, some words from Shantideva, a few different places in Shantideva put together. Now my life is fruitful. I've achieved true humanity. Today, I'm born in the family of Buddhas. Today, I become the heir of the Buddhas. Now, no matter what is required of me, I will act in accord with this, my family, and will never do anything that might sully this faultless and noble lineage. Like a blind person who might find a jewel among heaps of rubbish. So, somehow, this bodhicitta has arisen in me. This is the elixir of life, produced to vanquish the death of this world. This is an inexhaustible treasure, eliminating the poverty of the world. This is the supreme of all medicines that alleviates the illness of the world. And it's a tree of rest for beings exhausted from wandering the roads of worldly existence. It's the universal bridge for all travelers to cross over these painful states of existence. It is the rising moon of mind that soothes the mental afflictions of the world. It is the great sun dispelling the darkness of the world's ignorance. It is the fresh butter churned from the milk of Dharma. For the caravan of beings traveling the plains of worldly existence and starving for the meal of happiness, this is a feast of happiness that satisfy, satisfies them all. So today, in the presence of all the protectors of beings, I invite each and every sentient being to be my guest at this great celebration of my future Buddhahood. And all the well-being that will be achieved through my Bodhisattva commitment until I become Buddha. Therefore, gods, demigods, humans, all beings rejoice. So that's the closing word. You, my lovely friends, are going to become Buddha. That needs to sink in. It might not seem so obvious now, but it's the truth of the matter. Not quite sure who of us will get there first. It could be any of us. <laughs> it could be any of us. But this is what taking the vow is about. You are going to become Buddha. And on the way, you'll become a very great bodhisattva. You'll become a light to all those beings. You'll be like Kamapa. You'll be like Taisitubha. You'll be like our great teachers. So let's dedicate the goodness of this session. So nam diye tamche zikpani tomne ne pidranam pamche ne jega na chipalap trukpayi sipe sole drowa drowara show. Jan chup sem chu rinpoche ma jepa nam jejuchi jepa 
Nyampa me padang, come, come to Peruana Shore.